Um, <coughs> great. Feasting with friends. Let's uh, bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, as we close our weekend, I pray that what I say will be helpful and will kind of bring together a lot of the themes in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you look back upon history, if you could choose one team to be part of, I wonder what it would be. For Chris, it might be a great rugby team. Um, here's a few. Would it be the Eng what, so let's first of all let's, let's, let's start, start with the rugby team. Would it be the West Ham team? <laughs> uh, that won the FA Cup in nineteen sixty four at Wembley. Then they won the Cup Winners Cup in nineteen sixty five at Wembley. And then West Ham won the World Cup. Uh, <laughs> If you know anything of history, you'll know that the captain was Bobby Moore, who played for West Ham. The guy who scored the hat trick was Jeff Hurst, who played for West Ham. Um, just think, was there a Spurs player in the squad? I don't think there was. Um, and then the person who scored the other goal was, of course, um, uh, Martin Peters, who, funny enough, played for West Ham. Um, which, which team, or maybe it would be the, the, uh, the team that landed on the moon. Would you like to be part of one of them? Guys? That would be pretty, that'd be pretty good, wouldn't it? It'd be pretty neat. Or maybe it's the Bletchley uh, team that decoded the enigma and won the war so much quicker. It's super exciting to be part of a team that has a big mission to win the World Cup, to land on the moon, to beat an evil enemy. But, you know, as God's people, we, are, of course, have the biggest and most exciting mission any team could ever have. And before the Lord Jesus returns to heaven, what does he do? He gives his team uh, an amazing team talk, <laughs> the 12. And what does he say? Go into all the world and make disciples. Now, taking the good news to the whole world can feel a little bit frightening, a little bit daunting. That's why I think God puts us in, in local churches. So he doesn't ask, in one sense, he doesn't ask you guys to reach the whole world. He asks you to reach Bulldog, doesn't he? And maybe the surrounding areas. But he, he doesn't go to all the world. He says, just reach Bulldog. But what does it mean for our witness? To, what does it mean for you guys to witness to your community, to your friends, to your family? What's the best way of doing that? What's the best strategy? Or to put it in Proverbs language, what's the wisest way of making disciples in Bulldog? Well, there's lots of different ways of doing it, I'm sure. And uh, there's lots of different pictures. But the one we've just read in Luke, just turn to Luke 5, surely is, is one of the things we'd love to speak to, uh, to turn to. Just to look at Luke 5 again. And what's our mission? Our mission is very clear. It's to follow the Lord Jesus. And what does the Lord Jesus do? He calls sinners to repentance. So at its most basic level, that is what we're to do. That's what we're called to do, isn't it? And it will look as different as, the, as there are people in this in, in this room, where we have all so many different backgrounds. But the key thing is we will call people to repentance. And then a few chapters on, Luke 7. I once did a, once did a, uh, a series with our young people on the Friday night. I think it was an evangelistic series. And it was called Nicknames Given to Jesus. It's great. Maybe you should try that. Nicknames Given to Jesus. And in Luke, you see a nickname given to Jesus. John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking... And you say, as a demon, the son of man, so Jesus, came eating and drinking. You say, here is a glutton and a drunkard. Well, he's clearly not that. But this one, this, next, this nickname he's given, I mean, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. I mean, they spit it out as a sort of uh, a curse, a kind of a way of having a go at Jesus. But when Jesus hears that, how do you think he felt? Delighted. Yeah, absolutely. That is what I am. Bring it on. I mean, if that's how I'm remembered, a friend of sinners, then wow. Yes, 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 yes. That's Jesus, a friend of sinners, the greatest compliment you could ever be given. And if that's how um, they, they summed up the Lord Jesus, surely that's one of the ways we want to be summed up, isn't it? Um, my sister, my, my, my two sisters, neither of them are Christians, very close to them. And they were described in my old church at Chesington. And they said, it's the friendliest place on earth. That's pretty good, isn't it? You know, it's pretty good for a church to be called the friendliest place on earth. 
Uh, they were talking to somebody who couldn't get on with them. And they can't get on with them, them people. They won't get on with anyone. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, hallelujah. If that's how they view the church in Chesington, that's, that's pretty good. And then it brings us back to sort of to Proverbs 9, isn't it? Which uh, clearly, thankfully, that, that, that theme is really embedded in all our hearts. Proverbs 9, 5, where... Lady Wisdom says, come eat my food and drink the wine I've mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the ways of insight. As God's people, we feast together. But we feast together, and we, we've got to get this, and we have got it this weekend. We feast together at the feet of Christ. That's what we're doing. We're learning from him. I'm sure in your, in your spiritual walk, there's certain times where you understand a truth. And it just begins, it, there's a light comes on, and you just think, wow, I've never really seen, I've never really understood that. One of those moments for me was when I read um, Piper's book, um, Desiring God. I think, I don't know if people have ever read that. And there's a bit, he, he says that the, the way that people have understood the West, West, Westminster Catechism has been wrong. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And Piper says that's wrong. There's one word that's wrong. It's not to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Because if, if you use the word and, it's as if it's a byproduct. You glorify God. Oh, and you enjoy him. But you, to glorify God by enjoying him forever. So the purpose of your life is what? Is to enjoy God. Now just think about it. When you, when you enjoy something, what do you do? You glorify it don't you so if hopefully 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 next week i will go and see my beloved west ham and they're playing the team i dislike the most which all my family support chelsea and i hope we win now all right you might laugh (laughs) if we win if we win, and it's a great game, and West Ham are fantastic, and we score, we win 5 0. I will, or if we win 1 0, and it's, and it's a disputed goal. But if I come home, what will I do? I will glorify them. I've enjoyed the victory. You then glorify what you enjoy. And surely, what the Lord Jesus, he, he brings us to himself, and he says, Enjoy me. Enjoy me. Is there anything better you can do? But to enjoy God. That's what you've been created for. You've been created to enjoy Christ. That's what you've been created. And we do it, what? We do it, we do it together. We do it together. Now, what, the question I want us to ask us is, as we finish is, what does friendship look like within the feast? So this, we're feasting now, aren't we? We're under Christ's word and we're feasting with him. We're hearing from him. We're feasting together. Next week, I'm going to go to football with one, a really good friend of mine. He's a Christian. We'll talk about football, but we'll talk about our Christian lives. And when we, as we're on the tube and we're talking about Christian lives, we are feasting. We're thinking about Christ and how we're enjoying him. So we, 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 enjoy, we feast with Christ. Every time you're with a Christian, you talk about the Lord Jesus. You're feasting with Christ. At least that's where you should be. We feast together with the Lord Jesus. Now, when people come into Christchurch Bulldog, when people come into All Souls, when people come into the youth work at All Souls, um, what do we want people to experience? Think about this. What does it look like to follow Jesus' example and you and me be friends of sinners? Or, first of all, even before that, to be friends with each other? So when people come into Christchurch Bulldog, how do they see you relating as friends? It should, it should be quite different from the world. And that should be one of the attractions. You know, I do think um, different things in our culture make it difficult to share the gospel. Oh, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? There's certain roadblocks. And in some ways, that's a good thing. Because what it will do is it, it, will, it will force us to think, actually, the way that we relate as people is so important. They've got to see a difference there first. And if they see a see a difference there, then you can start talking about the roadblocks of sexuality and different things. But once they come in and they see it, the way that these people, the way they relate to each other is just so different. The way their friendships are really is different. And they see that, and then it might be different. So I want us to think, Lewis, C.S. Lewis said this, 
The next best thing to being wise oneself is to live in the circle of those who are. The one sense, I probably would say, you can't be wise on your own. Now, I want you just to think about friendships. Think about your friends at work, maybe. Think about, or your colleagues at work. Think about, just think about friendship groups in the world. How do they make, how do people make friends in the world? What sort of questions do they ask in their mind or in their heart? Pop, pop the next one up. I think most people in friendships in the world, these are the kind of questions they ask. Are they like me? Do they like what I like? Do they fit in within my background, class, colour or culture? But don't you think most people in the world, that's, there, w- there will be exceptions, of course there will. But on the whole, I think that's how people make friends. Would you agree? Are they like me? Do they like what I like? Do they fit in within my social, economic, racial culture? And if they don't, then you're probably not going to be, you know, the, probably the friendship isn't going to last. Now, how, how are God's people different? You know, there's a saying, isn't it? A very popular saying, you can't choose your family, but you can choose your friends. <laughs> All right? You can't choose your family, but you can choose your friends. I think that's wrong when it comes to Christians. Okay, put the next one up. See, I think these are the questions Jesus asks in friendships. The world says, are they like me? Jesus says, have I called them? Have I called them? Everybody within the feast, everybody's feasting with Jesus. Who's called them? Jesus has called them. The world says, do they like what I like? Jesus says, do they love my wisdom? So if they love Christ's wisdom then they love the thing that you love the most. And then secondly, do they fit within my social, economic, racial culture? Jesus says, how will you together enjoy God's wisdom and call others to feast? So everybody who's in the feast at Bulldog, who's seeking to trust Christ, Christ has called them. And they're to be your gospel friends. And you have, how much choice do you have? (laughs) None. <laughs> because if you say I'm not going to be their friend or if they, you're cliquey who do who, who you have a problem with? who do you have a problem with the Lord Jesus? we had a, we had a talk last, last week on developing multi-role, multicultural church which is obviously in London is a big thing and the guy was, he's pastor of an Ethiopian church he just this is more sort of ethnic thing but he said the question you ask is not what, what made me different or what made them different, the question to ask is, who made them different? <laughs> That's great. Because then, of course, the problem is with God, not with the person. So just think about that. Can you see, can you see when people come into Christchurch, it's worth asking, and I'm sure this is, this is happening, but in all of us, because of our hearts by nature selfish, can, can they see a, a radical difference in the way that you are friends? Um, can they see that? One person said this, Roy Ortland. He said, by our unity in Christ, we are not just being nice. We are being prophetic. We are saying to all the the divisive, selfish idols of the world, Jesus is Lord and you're not. Jesus makes life sweet and you don't. Jesus brings us together and you don't. So just, sometimes it's worth just standing back, isn't it, and just saying, what do you have at Christchurch Bulldog? You have a meeting of people that God has chosen to build Christian with, to be his people. And you're part of that. Why on earth did God choose you lot? <laughs> I remember Dick Lucas, whenever he used to preach, he'd say, he'd say um, you know, if I could see into your heart, I wouldn't want to preach to you lot. Why would I give up a weekend to preach to you lot if I could see your heart? But then he'd say, but if you could see mine, you wouldn't listen to me either. (laughs) (laughs) Which is true. Both are true, aren't they? Of course they're true. So the first thing is, is Jesus chooses. Jesus chooses your friends, you don't choose your friends. Okay, next one. 
Now, I want to think, the second thing is, is a wise friend is committed. So when people come in and see friendships within the church at Bulldog, they should see uh, a non-Christian seek to come into your church, your gospel community, and what should they see in your friendships? They should see a church, a group of people who are hugely committed to each other. Uh, just let's just look, read these verses. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Do not forsake your friend or a friend of your family. When a person enters the feast of Jesus, they instantly realize that these people are committed to each other. At least they should do. The way that they speak to each other is so different. Just look at, we're going to flip around a bit, but that's what you have to do once you get past chapter 9. Just turn to um, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. So when people come into Christchurch Bulldog, they see a group who are just so unique. Chapter 15, verse 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. They see a group of people who are working so hard to have gentle words, not harsh words, so that the individuals in the gospel community flourish. Just listen to Derek Kidner. The point here is that the quarrels depend on people far more than the subject matter. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? The point here is that the quarrels depend on people far more than the subject matter. Look at chapter 17, verse 9. What does a fool love? Chapter 17, verse 19, sorry. 17, verse 19. What does a fool love? Whoever quarrels loves sin. I mean, that's, that's Proverbs, although it's so blunt. Whoever loves a quarrel loves sin. Whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. Fools love quarrels because they love sin. Turn back to 15 verse 4. A soothing tongue is like a tree of life. But a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. So... People come in, maybe they're, they're all over social media, which often can be so harsh. So harsh. Maybe they come from a work environment where harsh words are all too common. Maybe they come from a family environment where harsh speaking is the culture of the family. And then they come into God's people. They see so much so different. Those who feast with Jesus learn to hunger for their words to bring life, to never crush anyone. They're committed to this because they want individuals in the gospel community to flourish. Just look at 26 verse 20 quickly. Well, look at 12.25. This is a beautiful verse. 12.25. Just all talking about how we talk to each other. 12.25. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. <coughs> you know, sin breaks us, doesn't it? Do you come to church sometimes just seeking to have a kind word to someone? If people come into Christ Church Bulldog, will see that, and I'm sure they do. You know, it's been a, for me, it's been a joy to be here this weekend, and I'd certainly go away saying, you're a very welcoming and kind church. But we can always be more kind. <laughs> we can always be more welcoming. You know, young people, it's always... Th think about your youth group. You know, when, when there's someone comes who is from the outside, even as young people, learn now to look out and welcome. So, you know, young people also sometimes are good at that, sometimes aren't. Um... And I have to say to them, I have to tell them. So last week there was two lovely Nigerian girl and boy who were there for the, f for the, for the first time. They were actually only there for a week, and um, one week, and then we go back to Nigeria. But one of the lads, he was one of the older lads, I said to him, Michael, we walk from All Souls to the youth work on a Sunday morning. It's about a 10-minute walk. I said, can you just look out for him? You can just talk to him. And to my joy, he talked to him the whole journey. Now that young boy will, will not forget that. 
remember calling someone into the, in, you were really low on numbers, and this, this uh, member of the church said, oh, I'll, I'll do it. Now, in one sense, he was everything that maybe a youth worker shouldn't be. <laughs> you, you know, it wasn't very fashionable. You know, well, it's actually, it's complete nonsense, but what, what the world says a youth worker shouldn't be. He, but he, he saw the need, and he, and he, he said, oh, I'll do that. And uh, he did it for a couple of years. And there was one young, young lad in the youth work who never lived with his dad. His dad was a nightmare. And over that time, he, he was there for probably about a year. He used to talk to him every time he walked to youth work. And this, this guy, who you wouldn't have put in a youth team, this young lad said, who really was with it, and he was very fashionable, blah, 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 blah. You wouldn't have put them together. But that relationship with that guy was the most significant thing in the youth work. Because he cared for him. Because he had a kind word. He was a young person whose spirit was crushed. And this youth worker, every Sunday, sought him out, had a kind word for him. Made a huge difference, huge difference to his life. There's lots I could say. There's an, there's a, Proverbs says a lot about gossip. I think if you're a Christian and you sit under the feet of Christ, you're going to destroy gossip. You want to go and destroy gossip in your own heart, in your own soul. Evil words die without welcome, and the welcome, and the welcome gives us away. Our welcome gives us away. It's a kidner again. Evil words die without welcome, and basically, if we do welcome them, our welcome gives them away. Listen again to uh, uh, Orland. This is what it means to love someone at all times. Just listen again to them. Just listen. When someone loves you at all times, good and bad, they don't have to but choose to. That person is a friend. <coughs> so as we feast together, we're seeking to have Christ change us. It would change us radically in our friendships. And then, and then thirdly and, and lastly is the next one. A wise friend is courageous. Just look at these. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. 27.9. Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. It's worth thinking, you know, if we're really wanting to be like Christ, to have his wisdom change us, then we do it together. And doing it together means you sharpen me and I sharpen you. Doing it together means sometimes I'm going to get it wrong and I need you to correct me. And sometimes you're going to get it wrong and I need to correct you. And the problem is, one of the problems is we're so British, aren't we? <laughs> we don't like saying anything to someone that might sharpen them because they might get offended. And we don't like anything being said to us. Do we? Is that true? But in a, in a, in a, I can remember, uh, it, was about, it was just before lockdown, and my best friend, who's not a Christian, I mean, he was having, he was having uh, quite a few um, struggles in his life. And we're very close. And he said, Trevor, I want you to tell me what would Jesus do in this situation? This is a non-Christian. <laughs> so I said, look, mate, can you give me some time to think about that? Can you give me some time? All right, I'll give you time to think about it. So I saw him about two weeks later, and the first, you know, I was sitting down having a coffee, and then he said to me, okay, what would Jesus do? Now, I had given it a lot of time. I had given it a lot of thought. I had given it a lot of prayer. So I said, look, mate, this is what I think your character is like. He's a, he's a beautiful, sa sa sort of saving character. I said, this is what your character is like, mate. But you can't save everyone. And you've just got to focus on this one relationship you've got and try and save that. You've got to get, you can't do it all. You've just got to do that. And as I said that, he just wept. And he said, Trev, thank you telling me the truth. Now that's what the, that's what the gospel community 
That's what we should be like, isn't it? Where we're saved by grace and therefore we're ready and open to be changed by each other. A friend of mine recently has been started going to an AA meeting and what she has said is this, is as you sit round, what you realise is there's people from every different walk of life. You might have someone who's a down and out, smelling the urine. You may have someone who's a premiership footballer, or you may have someone who's a famous actor, or you may just have a, a normal person like me. And she says, what, what, you, what, you, what you realize is this, is that because all of them have the same problem, there's no judgment whatsoever. Whoever you are, there's no looking down the nose at anyone. And what the person said, this, this person said to me is, and I think that's probably what the church needs to be like. And isn't that what it's like with, when Jesus feasts? There's only one perfect, perfect person in the room, and that's the Lord Jesus. And everybody else, they only have one need, and that's to listen to him. And depending, I suppose, on how wise different people are, will be within that group how they seek their wisdom. You know, it's really difficult being a mum and dad today, isn't it? So confusing. And there'll be different, you know, different, different families and come in different shapes and sizes here. I can remember when I was in Liverpool, there's a young lad, Robbie Taylor, and uh, he came from a very, very dysfunctional, fantastic mum, his dad was in prison, came out, his brother was in prison. He was just a real dysfunctional family. And Robbie went along to Bridge Chapel and they were rebuilding it. And um, a, couple of dad, a couple of the older men just took him under their arm. Well, where is dad? Where is dad? And then they, he, he got a job as a chef at a top hotel, went out to Dubai, then worked in the West End. Then he was my apprentice for a year. And now he runs Youth for Christ in Canada. Now, those men saw the need and were his father. That is what he needed. They were, they were, he is, God is a father to the fatherless. But he's a father to the fatherless through his people. And that radically changed his life. Uh, so so just, just think, what are, the, what are the different ways that we, as God's people, you know, we, we live in a very selfish world, don't we? The whole sort of FOMO friendships, fear of missing out. That's all totally selfishness, fear of missing out. My friend runs, um, uh, used to run student work, and he said, he's trying to get Christian students to commit so hard, and they commit right at the very end before an event because something else might, better might turn up. Well, that's an utterly selfish way. Go ahead, lads, don't you be like that. FOMO, it's very selfish. I'll only commit to something... I'll leave it as long as possible because um, something better might come up. Very, people come into God's people, they're, oh, they're so different, they're so committed to one another. But we do it together. One, iron sharpens iron. One per, uh, again, to quote Ortland, he says, by ourselves we become dull and blunted and lose our edge. Every one of us needs a friend who will not flatter us but will refine us. So just think about it. You know, what, what's it Paul says in church? You have older women teaching younger women. You have older men teaching younger men. Well, we need that, don't we? So you've got young families. I'm sure you're already doing this. You need to think through how we care and support them, bringing up children in a very mixed up, messed up world. Think of, you know, I, I hinted at it yesterday, but you think of um, the whole issue with porn. You know, we should be seeking to help each other with those issues. Older men helping younger men. Not pretending or wishing they weren't there. I wish they weren't there, but they are. So we need to think through how we sharpen each other, how we encourage each other, so that we are more like Christ. We can't do it on our own. Orton says this, there is a difference between hurting someone and harming someone. But the truth is, a friend 
when it, it will inevitably hurt you with words that are respectful, true, <coughs> and blunt. You know, the mark of a wise person is that they welcome someone reproving them. The mark of a fool is that they want to fight them. So the wise, the wise one realizes really that their heart is, is incredibly sinful. And then they want to be shaped. They want to be shaped by the spirit. They want to be shaped by the word. They want to be shaped by Christ. And usually the way that he does that is through his people. When lost sinners are invited into a wise gospel community like this, it will be attractive. And your, your community is attractive. I've loved it this weekend. But with all communities, we have our blind spots and we have our areas that we don't quite see. But friendship at the feast is so important. And when people come into this gospel community and they see gospel friends sharpening each other, loving each other, committed to each other, they're going to want to be here. They're going to think this is a safe place. They might not use words like wisdom and wise, but it will be. So my encouragement to you is keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. I hope that's an encouragement to you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the friendship Christ has with us. Thank you that we are part of your feast. Thank you that you are 100% committed to your people. They are your bride that you've died for. And your son and your spirit enjoy nothing more than being with them and molding them so they reflect the character of Christ. Father, thank you so much for the church at Christ Church Bulldog. Thank you so much that they are light on a hill. They are salt, light, and city on a hill. And Father, I pray for them. I pray as they feast together, as they enjoy Christ together, that they'll win others together as they come in and see a radically different type of people. So bless us now, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.